Hey, won't you stand up and, and get you a book and turn to page 12 and, and sing that song, C. It's called, Look What the Lord Has Done. Yeah, no, I can't hardly see. It's blinding me. Uh, maybe I should put my glasses on. You probably should. <clears throat> These glasses may start turning darker because they are what they call... What do they call them? Transition. Yeah, there you go. That's what they're... <laughs> Transformers. Transformers. All right, you ready? Here we go. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved us just in time. Oh, I'm going to praise His name. Goody, goody. Hey, let's go ahead and pray and let our pastor get up here for a little while tonight. So, uh, Lord, we come to you tonight once again thanking you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord. Uh, just we thank you for letting us come here on Wednesday night. And uh, right now we're kind of running half empty. So if you would help us tonight that we can uh, get full back again. And, and uh, help us t tonight, Lord, so when we hear what we hear that we can go out tomorrow and, and uh, help somebody else with what we've heard. And so we're going to thank you for that, Lord, in advance. And, and Lord, you know we got a lot of folks that just need your touch from you and a lot of people that's on our prayer list. And, and if you would, Lord, reach down and touch them tonight and we'd appreciate that. But Lord, we love you. We ask if you would. Bless our pastor. And we're going to ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. How many really meant that? Boy. I can tell you this, if we got what we deserved, where would we be tonight? Nobody heard that. If we got what we deserved, where would we be tonight? Thank you. Aren't you glad that God doesn't give us what we deserve? What He gives us is what His Son deserves. Think about that. And that is His righteousness, His peace. His joy, the things that we can't get down here except through Jesus Christ. Isn't that a magnificent thing? Philippians chapter 3, we're going to be talking about Paul is, we're going to see Paul's heart tonight, probably like we haven't seen it anywhere in the sense that what he's going to be doing, he's going to be opening up and sharing with us how much Jesus Christ and his message meant to him. Um, I'm convinced of a couple of things, and, and, and those two things are this, that for whatever purpose and for whatever reason, it seems that uh, there's, there's two things that relegates a New Testament church, and it seems like we're missing a good part of those in our, in our humanism that's kind of crept in and choked it out. Number one, that's the high view of God. God is sovereign. God does what He wants to when He wants to. He does never do anything inconsistent with the Word, but He does not appeal to humanity to give Him direction. And the second thing is the high view of Scripture. Those two things are actually the hallmark, the trademark of a New Testament church. And you'll find it here as Paul begins in verse 1 of chapter 3 in the book of Philippians, where we're at our last letter from Paul in our, in our New Testament chronological Bible study. We've gone through a lot of Bible. Did you know that? In the past, how many ever 
Um, I know it's been probably close to two years now that we've been in this New Testament chronological Bible study, verse by verse. And there's some truths, if you missed them, it's because you chose to. Amen? Others, is because we see it, but we don't want to embrace it because it's inconsistent with what we would like to believe. I can tell you, my believer and your believer sometimes is in our belief systems that we hold has a great deal of what to do with what we want rather than what God wants. So we have to be careful. And Paul's going to talk about that because remember, Paul loved Judaism. He was a Jew. He grew up a Jew. He wanted to be a keeper of the law. He was a member in all probability of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was blameless before the law. He loved the law of God. Listen to that, keeping that in your mind as we address this. And he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Paul was thrilled about his relationship with Jesus Christ. And he was absolutely thrilled that not only did he have a tremendous intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, but his word and his person had changed Paul's life. You know, the thing that really troubles me a great deal today in our society is even people that claim to be Christians, there's no life change. And I, and I, want, you, I want to say this because my heart's heavy. My heart's heavy for the condition our country and our churches are in. And, uh, and our young people, I love you guys, you young people, I really do, but you've got to battle because I promise you, the world today is telling you it don't matter what you do. And you're to do this and you're to have fun no matter what it does. I promise you, God is concerned with how you live. He's concerned with how we live, not just them. But And I promise you, we're, we're losing the moral battle. I guess you know that. We've, we've lost the battle in morality. And here's the part that I don't understand. I can understand it from the world. I expect it from the world. But it's beyond my comprehension to believe it of believers. Amen? That, I mean, that, not that we sin. We all do. But that we sin and don't care. It doesn't matter. And so Paul said, rejoice in the Lord. Now, that's where the peace is. I promise you, living a halfway Christian life, there's no peace in. There's no joy in. I've had some of that. How about you? There's just no joy in it. And he says, to write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous. But for you it's safe. He said, I need to write some things to you that probably is for correction's sake. And I need to correct you and warn you about some things and then tell you why I feel that way. And he did that in beginning in verse 2. He said, beware. And he calls them dogs. Wow. Uh, he's talking about false teachers. And, and boy, I feel the same way. I, I, any, any person that maligns the Word of God in order for their own personal satisfaction... That's got, to be a, that's got to be a scary thing. And that's why Paul used the language that he did. He said, beware of them. They're dogs. And beware of their evil workers. He's talking about the same people. And beware of the concision. For we, talking about those apostles, are, talking about Jewish apostles here, are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the what? Wow. Listen to me. Uh, about the time you think you've made it, you're in more trouble than I'm in. Because I promise you that I know, and that word confidence means trust. I do not trust my flesh. You know why? My flesh is not trustworthy. What about yours? No, it's not. We know that. We know that. And by the way, I'm not talking about skin and bones. I'm talking about what the skin, what's inside the skin and bones and what it wants to do. It wants to be inconsistent with what God says. So Paul said, we are of the circumcision, but we don't trust in keeping the law for our relationship with God, even if we could keep it, and he did, cause himself blameless. But he says, we have no confidence in that. Uh, and I, I want to warn you about self-righteousness, how dangerous it is. Because I promise you that pride goeth before a fall. Pride and arrogance of I've got it together, I've got all the truth. And I listen, I promise you about the time I think I've got the truth, God shows me something else. 
And as I can find it in this book, it doesn't matter. I want, I, that's going to change it. So he says, For we are the circumcision which worship God, and here's the kicker, in the Spirit. You and I can't worship God aside from the Spirit of God giving us the liberty to do so. And I've often said, and I want to say it again, God doesn't accept worship, does not accept worship from a disobedient heart. The worship comes from the heart. And it comes from a heart that's obedient. That doesn't mean that we're obedient in everything. It means we have a desire to be obedient in everything. And so he says, and we have no confidence in the flesh. Though, he said, I'm going to give you an example now. And I'm going to use myself as an example, Paul said. He said, for though I might also have confidence or reliance in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I have more. Now, Paul is being facetious here. He's not bragging on his religious credentials. He's using them to teach us a lesson. Uh, I, oh, I'm at church every time the doors open. Well, listen, the devil got here before you did. You know, well, I do this and I do that. Well, listen, I promise you, I know a lot of people who are not even Christians that are more religious than a lot of Christians. So he says, I don't have any confidence in the thing, even in my flesh, but I have a right to, if anyone has the right to have confidence in the flesh, because I was circumcised, verse 5, the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law, listen to this, Without fault. Blameless. Wow. Well, you know, if he was blameless, he had done all he could do to be saved and he was still lost. He had kept the law, every point of the law, according to his own profession. I was blameless. Yet he knew something was missing. And that something that was mis missing is what caused him to open this chapter with, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Because all the works of his flesh could not produce the joy of the Lord. And he says, verse 7, But, and I kind of had to inject this, But one day on the road to Damascus, I had a head-on collision with Jesus. Hallelujah. You know what most of us need? We need another head-on collision with Jesus if we've had the first one. Because we are living for ourselves, folks. 90% of us, we, don't, we, we want God to do what, we, what satisfies us. And, and I was saying, I've got I to gotta share this. I, I, got a, I got a letter Monday or Tuesday um, from the jail. And uh, this lady was um, female was writing from there because that's that's who we go to talk to when we're there with the AIP program and uh, she wrote the letter to me and I got it and she says uh, I have tried everything to quit using drugs everything and she put that in caps and in quotes and I have not been able to quit using drugs but someone told me that God could do what I couldn't do and I would like to have one of the AIP pamphlets, one of the addiction intervention pamphlets or books that we give out. And said, I have never been to a church. I've never held a Bible in my hand. I grew up in the Wicca religion. Would you please come tell me about Jesus? I will be going tomorrow. Here's what really got me. She said, I felt like it was a sign from God when I saw your name and address written on my cell wall. I thought, well, I remember God getting signs written on the wall before, amen. So this one's just a different kind. But uh, folks, let me say something to you. There are people out there that are really hungry for God. It may be, they may be in... You know what I think we need? We need some bad things to happen to us. Well, some of us already got some of that, right? But let me tell you why. Um, if everything goes too smooth, we forget how precious God is. 
and we begin to take him for granted. Would you reckon? Do we do each other that way sometimes, husbands and wives, because everything is going smooth and then everything blows up and there's a divorce on the, on the, on the counter the next time you come in? It's, it's dangerous to take things for granted, especially God. And Paul said, But what things were gained to me, those things, those I counted lost for Christ. Now he's talking about his religious credentials. All those things that I held so dear to me. I was, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrew. I was, a, I was a, a Pharisee. I was a keeper of the law. Blameless of the law. But I counted all those things that were gained to me. I counted them lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless. And I count what? All things but loss for the excellency. Underline that word because there's nothing on this earth that you can give that label to properly. Everything that means divinely, that means it's of God. But I counted all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge, gnosis, of Christ Jesus, my Lord. I counted all things, everything that was in my life up to that point that I depended on, the things that I, my reputation, my religion, my position, my status in, in my community, I counted them all lost. And by the way, he was literally dead to his family, to his religion, to everybody else. He was kicked out of the temple. He lost all personal belongings he had absolutely nothing except Jesus and I think that's probably enough for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them but garbage dung why that I may win Christ now I do not believe Paul was saying I had to give up all this in order to to get saved. I don't believe he said that. I believe he said those were the things that were in my way. And anything that was in my way of coming to Christ needed to depart immediately. It could be different things for you. It could be different things to me. But if anything is more important to any of us. Than our relationship of that excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Then we need to put it aside and count it as nothing. And that's what he said. And he said, not only that, and to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. i got to say something, folks. Uh, I'm convinced this is why this man had the power of God on him that very few people have ever had. And the reason is, Christ was, in fact, his Lord. Amen? He was his Lord. Everything else took second place, no matter what. It was him first. And he says, not only that I may win Christ, but to be found in him, and not having my own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. Remember, not Paul's faith, but the faith that Christ gave him. The righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. There's a powerful thought. He just said that I wanted to know him, and now I know him, but I want to know him in a very different way than just being saved. This is a powerful thought. I shared this with you before, and I'll share it again because it's in the line of thought. It's the same word, the word know, is the same word that's used of the relationship that's the most intimate between beings. And he says, I want to know him as close as you can get to him. I want to know him. I want to have that kind of relationship. And uh, guys, that doesn't come, that does not come with a thousand different things in our lives besides Jesus being first. That's when that comes. Whenever He's predominant. He is the one according to Him. That I may know Him and 
the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his what? I am not ready to sign up for suffering, are you? Oh, wait a minute. How do you know what Christ went through? I was, I've shared with someone earlier about pain. Pain's a marvelous thing. It's very therapeutic. It'll make you pray when you don't pray. Tell you something else it'll do. It may cause you to realize just a little bit of what your Lord suffered to die for you. But I, I do readily admit that pain is not, a, is not something that I would suggest that you go pray and ask God to give you some. Because the Bible doesn't ask us to ask God to humble us. He says, humble yourself. And if we humble ourselves, I'm convinced that's when we have the fellowship with God and whatever else he chooses to use in there. But he says, I want to be a part of that suffering so that I understand the price you paid for me so that I'm willing to pay whatever price for you. Uh, my wife and I were talking, coming. And I was talking about some of the missionaries that we uh, have the great privilege of supporting. I was thinking about what they've paid to serve Jesus Christ. I remember the first time that I, well, uh, someone introduced me to Lou and Marisa Davis. And it was Brother Bob Law. And he told me that he helped them load their meager belongings into a, a couple of boxes to put on, um, to be carried down to put on the boat to go to their place of ministry. They had sold everything that they had just to get on, just to get there on the boat. Uh, I don't know that kind of commitment, do you? I believe you can be committed to whatever ministry. Maybe it's not that ministry, but I'm talking about that kind of commitment. I'm not talking about commitment in the same sense that they are. But our commitment is, in many cases, is we're committed to God because we want God to do what we want Him to do instead of God use us for what you want us to do. And Paul was using this in that same sense. And he said, that I, want to be, I want to understand the fellowship. That means the commonness, the common union of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Wow. Not just being made in his image. I want to be conformable unto his death. And by the way, Jesus didn't just die to sin. He died for sin. We don't have to die for sin. We need to die to sin. That's what he was talking about. In verse 11, he says, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. I love this. This encourages me. Because, you know, I don't have it all together yet. What about you? I mean, um, the further I go, sometimes the behinder I get. And this helps me understand something. He says, I'm not there yet, but I tell you what, I follow after. I follow after. I won't quit trying that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Can I put that in a colloquial statement? Paul says, I want as much of him as he's got of me. And I want him to have as much of me as I've got of Him. I want to be apprehended of Him. I want to apprehend Him like He apprehended me. Wow. And then He carries it on and He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have arrived or apprehended, but this one thing I do, not a thousand things, not five, but one, Forgetting those things which are behind. I'm not looking back and think of all the things that I lost. I'm reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us. This is not just a statement for Paul. It was a statement for these Philippians and a statement to us. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect or mature, be thus minded, wanting to apprehend Christ at whatever cost. 
In American Christianity, we don't talk about cost. We talk about getting. Now, he's talking about cost. Whatever the cost, we should be thus minded. And if anything be otherwise minded, if any or if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule and let us mind the same thing. Paul said the price was high. The price that was paid for my sins were high. The death of God's Son. And I have no idea where this idea is that we should never have to suffer pain or lack or need or anything else. Where did that come from? It didn't come from here. And it just really bothers me when all of a sudden I was talking to some uh, met a guy in McDonald's today, my favorite place because they have eighty five cent coffee. <laughs> Pretty good reason, but that was uh, that had been here that we I met, and he he talked to me and he said, you know I don't I don't have anything to eat, and so I had the privilege of buying his breakfast, and I said, well tell me what's going on. He said, well, I lost my job. And he said, I lost my wife. Um, and he said, you know what? I haven't lost Jesus. And he said, I don't know what to do. And you know what? I, <laughs> all, I can, all I can do is say this. Just keep remembering you got Jesus and they can't take him away from you. And by the way, I'm convinced that God will either feed him or he'll take him to a better table. Do you understand what I just said? So you pray for that man. God only knows. And ladies and gentlemen, you look at me. Only by God's grace, it's not us. Only by God's grace, it's not us. Pray for him. we got a world. By the way, we are called to feed the hungry. We're called to help the poor. They are poor and hungry brothers and sisters in this world that we have much, much more than they have and my goodness alive, we ought to share it with them. Amen? You believe that? I sure do. I believe that's why God gives us these things. I don't believe He made American Christians as prosperous as we are just so we can. And by the way, He didn't make all of American Christians prosperous. Look around. Some of y'all sitting here. Anyway. We'll be picking up at verse uh, 17, the Lord willing, next time. Anybody have a question about what we covered?